we have this afternoon the 21st century generation uh, who will uh, tell us what it's like now um, after all the history and all the wisdom that we've heard. Um, but first, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Blair Doris Walter. He's going to show uh, an excerpt from a documentary that he is working on right now, The Fire This Time, about the Newark Seven. Hi, my name is Blair, and this film, will, like, like she said, will be on the Newark 7. This is just a seven-minute teaser to the forthcoming feature-length documentary. In 2006, I read an article in the New York Times entitled, Man is Stabbed After Admiring a Stranger. The article made it clear that a man was, and I quote, acting in a gentlemanly fashion and just paid the lady a compliment. What I could gather was that a group of women had been sexually approached by a man on the street and a fight had broken out. I immediately began organizing. I have yet to meet a woman, a gender nonconforming, trans or queer youth who has not experienced harassment or sexual harassment in some form. Yet if it happens in the workplace or school, there's at least potential for institutional repercussions. Why not on the street? All of you know the story of Sakia Gunn and that of Matthew Shepard. And many of you might know the study that was conducted here at Rutgers on the media attention given to these two stories. Uh, two years after Matthew Shepard's murder, there was over a thousand articles written on him nationwide. Two years after Sakia Guns, there were 12. Later I found out that the fight began with such comments as, I'll fuck you straight and I'll stick my dick in your ass. Each of these women were friends with Sakia Gunn and they all knew what was at stake. What resulted from the fight was a man who had approached them spent five days in the hospital due to what was later found out to be a hernia. Renata and Venice had strangle marks around their neck, busted lips, black eyes, and one of the women had a handful of dreadlocks ripped clear out of her scalp. And finally, all four of these women in their late teens, never been in trouble with the law before, were charged and sentenced with attempted murder, varying degrees of gang assault and assault, receiving three to 11 years in prison, and Renata lost custody of her five-year-old son. This is a really complicated story. It is not a criminal justice story where DNA evidence can prove their innocence. They were there, they participated, they fought back unapologetically. This is a story of Patrice, Renata, Venice, and Terrain, each of these women coming from supportive and loving families and communities. The film will follow the journey that rippled from the night of this fight as they struggled behind bars and their fight for freedom. Additionally, we will highlight the mainstream media's headlines providing context for the highly racialized and gendered vocabulary that allowed readers to feel that these were not really women, that they were not even human beings, but a vicious wolf pack worthy of no sympathy or support, and how this plays a direct connection into our legal system. And I just wanna say something about Patrice since she remains the only woman behind bars. Um, Patrice is a poet who wants to one day own a spa to give women a break from their daily lives and struggles. Her brother was murdered by a police officer when she was younger, and later so too is her cousin. What does it feel like to know that the very people that are supposed to protect you are one of your greatest threats? So the film poses this question, do we really live in a society where a judge or journalist can justly determine the threat that a queer person of color faces? This is a story where race, gender, and class intersect, leaving these women some of our most vulnerable and unprotected in society. And to quote James Creedle, who I admire deeply, said this is not an LGBT film, this is a, him, a film about equality and human rights. And two of the um, Terrain's mothers in the audience, but I can't see if she's here. If she's here, can she stand up? Is Tanisha here? I think that they're coming in late. Um, but their mother and sister are here, is she here? Um, and then when you go out today, there's envelopes that are uh, stamped and addressed to Patrice. So if you so feel, please write to her because every time we screen the film, we try to get a big group of people to send her letters and it really helps. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. So um, I was late this morning and didn't have a, an opportunity to formally welcome everyone and to say a bit about the conference and the work that we've been doing. So here's that opportunity. I'm out of breath. Um, what's today's date? 
November 12th, right? Can everybody, everybody say November 12th? November 12th. And why is that important? It's important because we're actually making history today. And um, this day marks a particular moment in these particular times during which a community of amazing folk have gathered to literally make history. The making of history is not a project that is relegated only to those in the academy, those who do the work of observing our lives and attending to our voices from a distance. But history is made through the living and the telling of our lives. It is made when we lift up our individual and collective voice. This initiative, today's conference, and the ongoing oral history archival project is a collective undertaking. Both seek to make space for the writing of our names, our struggles, our triumphs, and the very grains of sand that come together to forge this place that we have come to claim as Brick City. So we, queer and allied and black and brown and white and young and old, Newarkers from the south side to the north side and those of us who love Newark from afar gather here today to make legible our very existences in a collective history of this great city. What you will hear today and what you have heard should inspire and challenge you. What you will know tomorrow because of what you've heard today should move you, hopefully to gather your stories as if they were stones and share them as well so that legacies can be built on each one of them. So you're here on the second part, during which time you'll hear from a younger generation. And it's, you know, there's a scripture in the, in the Bible that says, out of the mouth of babes. And typically, you know, we think wisdom can only come from one source, from elders. But I think today we'll learn that wisdom also comes from those who come behind us. So we're thankful for you being here. We're thankful for doing this in the city. This is important. I think together we've created an institution that no one can ever erase. So no longer shall we be the rendered invisible subjects of the city, because now they have to tackle with the fact that our names, your stories, our legacies will be captured somewhere in this city, in somebody's library, in somebody's archive, always pushing against invisibility. So you should give yourselves a hand clap, because all of you have made history by being here today. Barrow's going to come up and say a bit about, um, she gives, she's going to give some directions um, in regards to this afternoon. We hope that you will stay and enjoy the festivities after this. So you have a little bit of time to think and you'll have some time to party. And we hope that you'll join us. Thanks. Hello. Um, I just wanted to um, just say uh, a few words about the Queer Newark Oral History Project. Um, this is in your uh, program, but you might not have seen it. Um, I just want to tell you the principles animating the Queer Newark Oral History Project, of which this is an opening celebration. Um, I want, these are the principles that we base this project upon. We are committed to inclusivity and access. Our aims include the following. Engage LGBT Newark youth in interviewing each other as well as LGBT adult, the adult Newark community, and mentor LGBT Newark youth to ready them for career and higher education opportunities. We will cement collaboration between Newark's LGBT political, service, and faith organizations and Newark and Newark area colleges and universities on the Queer Newark Oral History Project. We will catalog, collect, and make accessible existing interviews of LGBT Newark residents and former residents, including an immense number of interviews which are currently housed at Drew University um, and are uh, only now becoming accessible. These were um, a massive numbers of interviews that were done in the 1990s at the height of the AIDS epidemic. We are also uh, going to catalog and make accessible the interviews completed by Newark's own LGBT commission. Finally, our goal is to encourage LGBT Newark and former Newark residents to donate their papers and other artifacts to our growing collection of queer Newark. And uh, if any of you are interested uh, in donating anything you have, pictures or uh, letters or old emails or anything at all, flyers, 
Um, please, uh, you could sign up outside to donate things. I hope everyone got these nice, free, beautiful black pens that we are giving away. Uh, <laughs> and on the pen, you will see the address queer.newark.rutgers.edu. If you look on, the, um, on that website, there's uh, places, you, we have a bibliography about Queer Newark up there, we have information about Queer Newark, about some of the great artists that you've, whose work you've seen today, and also a place where you could find information if you want to be interviewed, if you want to donate anything. These are all important things that we hope everyone here considers being part of. Okay, and just a few reminders. Um, first of all, uh, everyone should remember to fill out uh, the exit surveys is these little purple forms that's in everybody's program. It's a, really a huge help to us if you will fill it out. It should only take a minute. Um, so before you go, you fill that out and you leave it outside. There's a place to leave it. Um, and now just a few more logistical issues. If you've parked on deck one, remember to stop at registration on the way out for your parking coupon. We'd also like to encourage everyone to stop by and visit the exhibit, which is outside there, um, which is running loops of, the, of some of the fireballs that you heard about uh, earlier this morning. Um, and there's an exhibit out there. There's also some of the clothing worn at some of the balls, um, which were brought here by James Creedle and are there for you to see. Um, also, we have an oral history booth outside the um, outside this room, where if anybody wants to go and say their piece, tell their story, anything you want to say, we want to hear, and you can go into the booth and um, be recorded, okay? And finally, uh, please everyone, um, there's a reception at four, uh, and uh, downstairs in the Robeson Art Gallery, so it's just down the stairs, you'll see it, but, but at six o'clock, we're having a celebration, party, performance, at Coffee Cave at 45 Halsey Street. It's six to nine. This is something that's been organized by queer Newark youth, which will, there'll be spoken word performers, vogue performers, music. It's just gonna be a wonderful thing. And everyone is invited, and, and please remember to come to that too so we can celebrate this wonderful day together. Okay, thank you. A few more minutes, we'll have the next panel. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here today to participate in history. Uh, my name is Tanisha McCarris. I'm in the business of advocating and working on behalf of children through education and youth development. And I am so excited to be here today. I was so moved by the previous two panels. And I know you all, I will be moved by these dynamic young people that are going to share with us today. So when I introduce their names, I'm going to ask all of you to give them an excited applause and love. Um, is that all right? That is all right. OK. We have Erica. Yes. Yes. Danielle. And Keon. Terrell is on his way. We know life happens and he is in traffic. But when he is on his way, feel free to pause me at any moment and give him the same love that you just shared with everyone today. So I'm going to jump right in um, and ask the first question is talk to us about your childhood and your teens, which was not too long ago, and your experiences in Newark or the city that you're from. And we're going to start with Keon. So um, I like to describe my childhood and my um, life in general um, by the three G's. And it's taken me um, a while to remember these three G's and to embrace and celebrate them. And that is gay, glamorous, and ghetto. <laughs> and so I was, um, <laughs> I was born and raised by uh, my single a single parent, my mother, she, um, she gave birth to me when she was 18, so she was pretty young. And um, my uh, grandmother has also been a huge part of my life. So I grew up in a very strong 
female presence and a strong feminine energy. And so I was a very effeminate child. Um, and I always loved to perform for my mother, my grandmother, and, um, and my mother's girlfriends. Um, and, I, and so I, um, I feel like I knew, how to, I knew how to vogue before I knew how to walk. And so my mother's friends would come visit, and I would, um, I would be young, and I would just like, they would come over, I'd get excited, and I'd like go and grab like a towel, wrap it around my waist, and just like strut up and down and back and forth like I was on the runway um, for my mother and her friends. And um, when I was young, a lot of people, uh, the people in my life at that time, um, they really, they celebrated, and they helped me celebrate um, what I've come to understand as my own uh, feminine energy. And um, like I remember, I would be young. My, I call my, I consider my grandmother, uh, in gay culture, we have gay mothers and gay fathers. I consider my grandmother my gay mother because um, she's just this really sort of like, she's a diva. She's just like this fierce, like uh, older woman. She has nails that are like this long. They're always like hot pink or orange. <laughs> she, um, she calls me every Sunday to tell me what she wears to church. And so last Sunday, she wore a black, uh, a black mini leather mini skirt and uh, a cheetah, a cheetah uh, tank top over a, a sheer blouse. And so she's just like this <laughs> fabulous <laughs> diva where that's where I get it from. Um, and so all these women in my life sort of, you know, helped celebrated me and who I was. And um, a, a turning point in that was when I got older, when people started to, uh, to care about how I carried myself and how, how my body moved. And so I remember fifth grade being a distinct turning point in my life. Um, it was when, uh, uh, fifth grade was when, like, you know, kids can be a little cruel, so like everyone had, um, everyone had something that people would like pick on you about. And so for me, people would, my thing was that like I was gay, you know, I was flamboyant, I was a fag. And, um, and I remember in fifth grade, uh, this is so clear in my mind right now, I was um, sitting on my mother's friend's bed and we were listening to Mary J. Blige's album. And I'm like lip singing to my life and my, my, the whole time my, my wrist was limp. And my mother saw me and she said, straighten your wrist. And I said, I, I tried and it just stayed limp. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, straighten your wrist. And she like took my hand and straightened it, but it kept going limp. Um, and she got really angry and frustrated at me and I couldn't understand why. Um, the fact that she wanted me to straighten my wrist. Um, and in fifth grade is when, you know, she took me that summer, she took me to, um, I lived in East Orange at this time, she took me to Oval Park, signed me up for football, and I remember she told uh, my coach, I was standing right there next to her, she said, I need you to teach him how to be a man because I can't. And um, fifth grade was the first time that I told my mother that I was sexually abused. And, um, and at that point, the feelings that I felt as um, fifth grade was also the first time where I had my first crush, my first this guy who was on my football team. And um, I wrote about it. I had this little Harry Potter journal, and I wrote about it one day. And my mother and my uncle had found this journal, and they were reading through it. And I remember coming in the house, and I see them reading my journal, and I was just like, this fear, this anxiety just was like in me because she was turning the page. I didn't want her to get to this page, so I ran in the house. I like snatched the journal out of her hand, ran to the bathroom, tore it out, and just like flushed it down the toilet. So that was when I realized a lot of these feelings and desires and uh, emotions that I had were considered unacceptable. Um, and that's when I first began trying to uh, consciously conceal and hide those feelings that I had. But it was a glamorous <laughs> childhood otherwise. Um, let's see. I 
grew up chubby and as a tomboy, so I didn't necessarily have the like, hey, I want you to dress in like skirts and stuff, unless I had to match with my sister because I do have a twin and she's like a hood skinny version of me. But like, it's not, it's not a game. Like, she'll shut this place down. Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I had a really, I liked my childhood because my brother wasn't, I, like I have an older brother and he's not hammer nail savvy at all. I am the hammer and nail savvy person. Um, so I really didn't have like, the issue like, I wasn't like, um, we didn't have a really like religious family and stuff like that. However, like my mother's side of the family kind of like knew that I was like a tomboy lesbian and they tried to kind of like inch my mom to like have me do different things. Like I'm inside watching the game with like all the guys and stuff like that and I get told, go outside and play. Do what? With the girls? They're not playing, they're standing. <laughs> playing requires dirt, they don't like it. <laughs> um, and that was like pretty okay. Like I, I knew that I had like these feelings because I was raised on cable and when you didn't have like a child lock on the box. So like I knew that Ren and Stimpy was gay and I knew that HBO on Thursday nights after 11 o'clock some interesting things came mm. on. Um, <laughs> and that was my sexual education. Um, so, and that, like everything kind of like, it wasn't even like a religion of um, Christianity, it was a religion of like, we're a black family and in the suburbs, we are competing with other black families in the suburbs, as long as like, you dress accordingly when we need you to, and I play the piano as well, and like, so, when the people came over, my mother sat me down, and I was just like, <laughs> and I was like, look at my daughter, she plays the piano. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because of course there was like this Asian kid who lived like down the street and around the corner who was like a champion orchestra freaking violinist and stuff. <laughs> By the time he was 10, it was disrespectful. Like no competition, I, I just can't. Um, it really, like things didn't really change uh, for me until like, yeah, around like fifth grade and stuff like that where my mom was really sick of uh, pressing my hair because she knew like she could run that hot comb through it but I'm going outside to play basketball and it's sweating out. Um, she got me a perm, and um, then was just like, I need you to start dressing in girls' clothes. We're going, uh. And then I dressed in girls' clothes, and she realized the extent of my femininity will terrorize everyone, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that was when, like, I was trying to play it straight. So, like, oh, I'm pretending that I like him, but I'm about to go ham on this pretending. <laughs> Don't. Make me wrap my hair up in a doobie and everything. I will fight you. I don't care if he doesn't like me. I will fight you still. Um, <laughs> um, and then that was like around the time where like, like fifth grade, everyone was like, oh, you're a lesbian. And I was just like, kind of, yeah. And I told like this one girl who I thought was a lesbian too. Turns out she wasn't. <laughs> Depressing. Um, and like I realized at that point in time that lesbian wasn't a good word. And I realized a little bit after that, like Jehovah's Witnesses stopped by, and since like my family didn't necessarily let them in, like they left things like pamphlets and cartoon kind of books, and they left one um, with like Sodom and Gomorrah, and like I read it, so I'm like, ooh, comic. I like comic pictures. Flip, flip, men laying with men. Come and let me rape you. Whoa, a little concerning. Then you flip over to the next page, and it's like this kind of like really PG, I tried to do a PG done orgy scene, and then after that, it's fire. Everything's gone. And then it was kind of just like, homosexuality is this, and that Levitical code and stuff like that, and I was just like, wow, that sucks. Um, yeah, my childhood was okay, like, it was interesting. When I was like chunky, uh, I could dress in anything I wanted, but when like I started to kind of fill out, um, that's when I was expected to kind of stop and kind of um, adhere to the gender roles that were assigned to me. Um, it was when I didn't that like 
I needed a reason not to. So it was kind of like, I played basketball, and that's when I got really into sports and stuff, because I was like, if I do sports, I can dress in sweatpants and basketball shorts all day, and I can just be fine with it. Um, and then I came into like my freshman year of high school and stuff, and like, I didn't, t <laughs> this was the mistake I made. I didn't tell my brother and my sister who were going to the same school as I was that I was a lesbian. They found out when the rest of the school found out, when I decided it was okay for me to take the huge gay flag and like wrap it around myself because I wanted to be invited to the gay table where the cool kids were, you know. <laughs> And of course, in high school, I didn't necessarily have the wardrobe to be hanging out with the cool gay kids, but of course, that's another topic. Um, well, having a childhood to me was like kind of a difficult thing. I grew up in a home with my grandmother and grandfather and all my brothers. So I was basically like a boy in the house. I was suffering with all my brothers. I was rougher than all my brothers. I was able just to go do things that they couldn't do. But I was always feminine. Everybody noticed in like elementary school that I was feminine. No matter how much I fought, no matter how much stuff I started, no matter how many girlfriends I had, they always sensed like, oh, he's going to be gay. He's going to be gay. He's going to be gay. So anyway, um, as my years of just growing up, I just basically just tried to fit in with society with my brothers and them, tried to do the things they was doing. My grandfather was like really strict on me because he was from the South. So I used to always dance because I used to watch wrestling and I used to watch like um, Nightsville Girls. And he used to see me doing a dance, he used to kick me and say, boys don't dance like that. So I kind of knew like if I wanted to be gay, then I knew I was like, oh, I wish he, hate to say this, I wish he died so I could be gay. I wish he do this so I could be myself. So um, he's always say that if you be gay, we're going to send you down south. You're not going to be up here with us because we don't want no gay people. That's why your other gay faggot A cousins can't come around you because they're gay. Lead them in Virginia and stuff. So as like when I got to fifth grade, you know, I found myself like the other two over here found themselves. My grandfather passed when I was in the sixth grade. So my grandfather died when I was in the sixth grade. I just became like more like I was like, ah. Oh, this is it, my grandmother, just me, her, my two brothers or whatever. So I just basically just like running around. It's just great. Like I hit it though, I still had girlfriends, but I was becoming more feminine. I would look in the mirror and say, oh, maybe I want to get long hair. So I tried the S-curl. I tried like all the stuff, like all the boys was doing, <laughs> like, like the regular stuff. And then like um, when eighth grade came, um, I told my mother, like, um, I want to get girl pants. And she said, you can't get girl pants. I said, why? She said, because them are for girls. I said, no, we don't say that in the store that I went to. She said, <laughs> she said, um, she said, she said, yeah, them are for um, girls. I said, all right, then I'm just not going to ask her to get it. So then, like, I started sneaking out, going to the Globe. I used to sneak out. I used to climb down the fire escape, tell my brother, don't say nothing. I used to have my clothes in the bag. I used to change, put my clothes on. And then one day, I had went and got my nails done. And I forgot that I had nails on, because I saw it was in boys' clothes. And I just used to get my nails done. And my grandmother had came in, and she had um, made me some breakfast. And I grabbed the plate. And when I grabbed the plate of food, she didn't say nothing. And I was unaware that I still had nails on. So therefore, um, when I came out, my whole family was sitting there. And that's when it got like very like, tough for me, where I had to make decisions, either to be myself or let them control me. And my grandmother, my whole family, my mother slapped me to the floor. My brothers was there, my uncles and everybody. And my mother said this to me, you know why I don't want you to be gay? I said, why? She said, all faggots die from AIDS. And I don't want my son dying from AIDS. And I said, um, how you know I'm going to be a faggot? And she said, yeah, because you're wearing nails, you're going to wear hair, here, you're going to wear this stuff. And then it was a big thing, basically saying, like, if I wanted to say a gay male, it was acceptable. But since I wanted to be a trans woman, it was out. So at 14 and 15, I just packed all my stuff up, and I just kindly went. So that was my childhood. So Terrell, we can give Terrell.